pleasant day. It's Alicia, and I'm here for another Bible study. Today we'll be studying Acts chapter 1. Let's pray before we begin. Most righteous and eternal Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus, under the authority of the Holy Spirit. Father, we love you. We applaud you. We give you thanks. We lift you up. We exalt your name. Father, we give you all the honor, all the glory, all the power, all dominion that's due unto your name. Father, your name is holy. Hallowed be your name. Father, you are righteous. You are true. You are altogether lovely. Father, you're merciful. You're kind. Father, you are creator. Father, you are ancient of days. Father, you are mighty. You are everlasting. Father, there is none like you. Father, you've said in your words, besides you, there is no other. So we know that there is one God, that our God is one. And the most beautiful part is the oneness. So we give glory unto you, Father. We give glory unto you, Jesus. We give glory unto you, Holy Spirit. Our God is one. Praise be to God. So, Father, as we, your children, come before you, we pause to acknowledge your goodness in our lives. Father, you have comforted us. You have given us your love. You have given us your peace. You have given us your joy. You have given us your long suffering. You have given us your goodness. You have given us your gentleness. You have given us your faith. You have given us your meekness. You have given us self-control. Father, you have blessed our lives with every good and perfect gift. Praise be to your name. And Father, we receive them with thanksgiving. So we also open our mouth and shew forth your praise with thanksgiving. Father, we bless you and praise you because we know you are our God. So we will always come before your, your presence with singing, with thanksgiving, with blessings due to your name. Because you have blessed us. You have given us everything that we couldn't ever imagine to need and so much more. Father, and you continuously provide. Great provider or sustainer or keeper or defender our protector, our preserver. Father, we love you. And Father, as we present ourselves before you, we humble ourselves. And we acknowledge our sins. Father, we confess our sins before you. Because we acknowledge that we have sinned against you. So we confess our sins before you, Father, and we repent of them as well. Father, teach us to walk in the way that Jesus is, circumspectly. Father, because you forgive our sins, you blot out our transgression. Father, you also teach us your ways. We're grateful. We're grateful. Father, we ask that you will fill us up with your righteousness. Fill us up with your peace. Fill us up with your joy, unspeakable and full of glory. Father, fill us up with your spirit of truth. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Holy Spirit, for an habitation. Holy Spirit, dwell. Fill us up with everything. Holy Spirit, fill our hearts. Fill our soul. Fill our mind. Fill us up. Holy Spirit, clean house. 
cast out anything and everything that's not of you. Clean house. And teach us your ways. Holy Spirit, because you're our teacher, you will teach us all things. Holy Spirit, we request of you, help us with discernment so that we will be able to understand the good from the evil, so that we will be able to understand too. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God. Right? To the pulling down of strongholds and casting down imaginations and every everything that exalts itself against knowledge of our God. And we bring every thought in subjection to the obedience of Christ. We bring them into subjection with through you, Holy Spirit. We do not desire our own lives. Self has been buried. And so we rise in newness of life. So Holy Spirit, as you renew us, as you renew her mind, as you renew her heart, as you renew her soul every day, teach us to yield to you, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, do the good work you desire to do. Holy Spirit, let not our enemies be comfortable. Holy Spirit, as you, as you raise up your defense around us, as you raise up your standard, as you surround us with your fire of anointing, Holy Spirit, we ask that you will consume the enemy, that you will restrain and push them back, that every demon will fear, they will run, because they cannot come up against you. You're mighty. We're grateful. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that you will give us your wisdom and your understanding. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that you will reveal to us your knowledge. Father, we also ask in the name of Jesus that you will enlighten us as to what fear in you is about so that we will live in fear of you, Father. Father, we ask that you help us to grow closer to you, to be drawn closer to you, because we are aware that you are able to do it. It's up to you. It's all possible through you. So, Father, today as we draw closer to you, we yield to your will, Father. Let your good pleasure take precedence in our life. Let only your desires rule in our hearts. Let your plans prevail in our lives. Father, let your thoughts fill our mind. Let your will anchor our heart. And let our souls yield to you, be full of you, be so in love with you, Father. Father, we ask that you rise up the church. This is no time for the church to be sleeping. Father, we ask that you will wake up the ones that have been dead for years. Dead. Dead in their spiritual gift. Dead. Because they have no anointing. Although the Holy Spirit is dwelling, they have no anointing because they have not been subjected to the Holy Spirit. Because they have not yielded to the Holy Spirit. So they're dead. So while the Holy Spirit keep them, preserve them, they're dead. Because anointing is not upon their life. So Father, we ask that in the mighty name of Jesus, you will flow in their lives. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we ask that you will wake them up to understand gifts of the Holy Spirit are without repentance so that they will realize they have been given a gift. Use it for the 
building up of the church according to the Holy Spirit's guidance so that we will grow together in oneness. Because we know that the Holy Spirit cannot dwell in a vessel that's not filled up and that's not altogether kept and preserved by you. We know that. So while, while the Holy Spirit will come in and while the Holy Spirit will convict and while the Holy Spirit will keep and teach and comfort, we are not going to be mobilized unless we are fully subjected because it's not of ourselves that we're mobilized and it's not we by ourselves that are moving but we are being moved by the Holy Spirit. We are being preserved by the Holy Spirit. We are being kept by the Holy Spirit. But we are also being sent out by the Holy Spirit to do our spiritual gift. We are being pushed by the Holy Spirit into action. We are being trust by the Holy Spirit into doing the will of God. We are being trust by the Holy Spirit to take over so that we could rise up against every evil spirit in the world, so that we could set on fire all the plans of the enemy, so that we could set on fire all the evil of this world, so that we will not be subjected to the enemy, so that the devil will not have an anchor or a place in our life, so that we will cast out every evil imagination, so that we will also tear down every altar, that have been erected, whether it was erected by us, willingly or unwillingly, knowingly or unknowingly, or they were erected by our ancestors. Father, we tear them down in the name of Jesus because we want nothing to do with the devil and we want nothing to do with anything of the kingdom of darkness. So, Father, we present our ancestors and their evil ways and their schemes that they have a bit in alignment with the enemy. We repent on their behalf because we understand that we can repent for them in that we can't repent to save them if they have been lost. But we understand that we should repent of the sins that they have passed down to us so that we could break generational curses, so that we could break and dismantle every demonic stronghold so that we could break and dismantle every right the devil think he has to us so we are breaking down generational curses we are for, we are asking you father forgive our ancestors for their evil father particularly those that were very wicked those that were very profane those that were blasphemous those that saw the innocent being hurt those that saw the righteous being punished and, and being made to suffer unjustly. Father, we repent of the sins of our ancestors, for those who have killed, for those who have stolen, for those who have outrightly destroyed. Father, we repent of their sins because we do not desire for their sins and the repercussions of their sins to fall upon us. In the mighty name of Jesus, as we repent of our sins, as we ask that you will blot out our transgression, we ask that you blot out the transgression of our ancestors, particularly those that are left hanging over the generations. And Father, we ask that you blot them out permanently. That way, nobody coming after will ever have to suffer. And we ask them that you blot them out not just in our lives, but blot them out from the very root so that none of, our, none of our family members can suffer because of these generational curses. Tear down the altar. Destroy any agreement, any contract, any marriage that they have set in place. Anything that they have given as right, they have no right. We revoke and denounce in the name of Jesus. We dissociate 
and we disallow in the name of Jesus. We annul in the name of Jesus. Father, as for those gifts that they have been they have received of the devil, we ask that you reveal them so that we could cast them out, filthy and profane that they are, so that we will not continue to accept their spiritual gifts of demonic influence, but we will denounce them. If they are protection that they have been given, we will renounce and denounce them. We do not need to be protected by the devil, because the devil cannot protect nobody. But we will yield to you, Holy Spirit, under your protection, under your anointing. Because we are all for Jesus, we do not want nothing to do with ancestral protection. So we ask that, Father, you cast them down, that you renounce them, that you that you, you, you expose them for the filth and the lies they are. Father, that whatever they were using to control our generation will be dismantled and destroyed in the name of Jesus, obliterated in the name of Jesus, so that we could be set free. Because Jesus, you are the ones who set the captives free. You are the one who set at liberty. So we receive freedom in the name of Jesus. And we will rise up in the name of Jesus, for Jesus, through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And we will go forth knowing that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. That we do not war in the flesh, but in the spirit. So we will war against the principalities and we will war against the powers and we will war against the rulers of darkness of this world. And we will war against the spiritual wickedness in high places. And we will war against every single demonic influence. Every single demonic oppression. We will war against them. And we will tear down their strongholds. And we will obliterate their altars. Father, release the armies. Kick over their pot. That is so busy boiling. And out the fire. Because, Father, you have said in your word that you will frustrate the tokens of the liars. And, Father, you have said in your word that you will drive, you will drive them, the vampires mad. You will make them go crazy. And you have said in your word, Father, that you will turn their wise men backward. And you have said in your word, Father, that you will make their knowledge foolish. And you have said in your word, Father, that you will confirm the words of your servant. And you have said in your word, Father, that you will perform the counsels of your messengers. So we are aware, we are sure that you will keep your word. And we trust in you, Father, and we know that you will not let the wicked have any peace. Because your word has said there is no peace for the wicked. And you have also said that they will have no rest. So we praise you. We lift you up. We exalt you, Father. And as we go into our Bible study, Father, we ask that you open our mind to receive you. Open our heart to receive you. Open our soul to receive you. Holy Spirit, because we need the words to be grafted in. So Holy Spirit, plant them in our heart, in our mind, in our soul. Plant them on good grounds that they'll bring forth fruits in abundance for the kingdom. Holy Spirit, reveal unto us the interpretations and understanding so that they are clear. And the prophetic words, let them flow to us who have prophetic gifts. And the healing, let them go to those who have the ministry of healing. And the exaltation, let them flow to those who have exaltation. And the apostleship to those who have apostleship. And the pastoring and ministering to those who have pastoring and ministering. And the teaching to those who have teaching. And all the other spiritual gifts. Gifts of discernment, gifts of tongues, gifts of service. All the other spiritual gifts. Let then flow so the church could be equipped for the duties we have to perform because we're all laborers in the vineyard, Father. And we will go forth performing our work in you.
because we are called for good works. And so, Father, as we go forth in our day, as you have given it to us, we have given it back to you, Father. Be with us in our going out, in our coming in. Father, be with us in the daytime and in the nighttime. Father, while we yet sleep, guard our mind, our heart, our soul. Stamp your name upon our life and let us not be ignorant because it's the ignorance that causes us to suffer. So help us not to be okay with little knowledge. Help us to grow spiritually. Increase our faith, Father. Increase your anointing upon our lives, Father. Increase our belief in you, Father. Increase our, our fear of you, Father. And increase your righteousness upon our life. Holy Spirit, pour out on us without measure so that we will be empowered to walk in you and to talk in you and to live our life in you. Jesus, we don't want just a moment with you. We desire to be with you forever. So bond with us. Your oneness be manifested in our life. So it's not just an imagined thing. But we will understand and operate in the oneness. Jesus, let your love flow over us. Let your robe of righteousness cover us and lead us into the way. Jesus, we love you. But it's your love for us that counts most. We're grateful. We're grateful. And so, in our going out, in our coming in, Father, we need you. Holy Spirit, go ahead of us. Breathe upon the places we have to go. Drive your anointing into every con, every crease. A standard will be lifted up. Peace will prevail. Praise God. Holy Spirit, teach us to trust in you wholeheartedly, to yield to you wholeheartedly. Praise God. Father, as we go forth, there are requests that we may have, that we do not even know to ask. Father, you know every request. You know all our heart. You know every need of the saints. Father, I place the saints before you. I even place those who are to be saved into the fold before you. Father, you know the sinners. Remember them. Expose them to the truth. Father, you know the wicked. You know the wicked. Help them to understand. If they don't come, they will, they will lose. Father, as for our enemies, we leave them in your hands. Father, but as we go forward, I present the saints, the request of the saints to you, Father, that you will strengthen the church so that we could understand and, and know that the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. That we will not just read, but we will understand what that means, Father. And Father, whatever request I fail to mention, you will grant it because you're good and you're true. You do not need me to pray to you to know what we have need of. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And so, Father, as we go forth today, as we meditate upon your words, as we call out to you, as we meet with you, we wrap our prayers in the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, our King. We anoint our prayers with the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit, our Comforter. And we send them up to you, Father, sweet Savior. May they be acceptable in your sight, Father. You are our God. You are in oneness with us. We are grateful. In Jesus' name, we are praying, believing, because we know he is our hope, our everything. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Let's begin. Verse 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus begun both to do and teach. Now, 
This is Luke, a disciple of Jesus, who was a physician as well. He was one of the persons who were routinely following Paul. Right? So he often go with Paul on his journeys. And he was basically a part of the ministry. He served valiantly and he is the one who wrote the gospel of luke also unto theophilus so here he is writing again unto theophilus so the former treatise is mentioning here it is his gospel of luke that he had written See, because the gospel had to be preached. But some persons, because of where they live or the functions they were performing, they had to be written communication. You know, because what needed to be discussed was so extensive that a mere conversation was not enough so here we had him writing onto Theophilus right Theophilus is of some kind of public office right because in his gospel he referred to him as most excellent Theophilus right and we do know that that is an official title right of the Roman empire like they would they would often give those titles to persons of high office so we know that theophilus was of some high position right so here he was writing to him you can understand that writing to a person who is in high office who has an interest in jesus who is a believer they would need they would there would there need to be discretion, right? So conversing with him, meeting with him all the time in person may not have always been possible, right? Writing the written word would have been very acceptable because he could read it in his own time, he could read it over and over, and he could also share it with persons who are of similar interest. So you see how this is this is actually good and essential too for us, right? Luke himself was a physician, very beloved. But you see, Luke, though he was a physician, he was a disciple of Jesus full time. Right? It's a wonder how he practiced as a physician but i'm sure he must have incorporated the ministry in everything he does which is what we should do in our lives our lives should not be fragmented as the world would want us to live our life should be one in oneness singularity not fragmented we should not be believers of jesus christ one day of the week or some hours of the day we should be believers of jesus christ children of god every single minute of every single day regardless of what we do we should be we should be a child of god in everything we do right it should not be one of our titles or one of one of the things that we have claimed for ourselves. No. We are a child of God. We are children of God. We are children of God. It should be clear, right? So he is writing to enlighten Theophilus together with his gospel along with this book of acts to 
enlighten him of what Jesus begun to do and continued to do, right? Both while he was here and when he ascended, right? So Jesus did not just perform miracles. Jesus preached the gospel and taught us many things. So here, after having given the overview of the gospel of Jesus ministry, he is now showcasing to Theophilus what transpired with the disciples, the apostles of Jesus, particularly following his ascension, right? And this is very essential because, you see, we needed this for us as well. So you could see that God in his eminence, in his excellent goodness, in his magnificence, in his sovereignty, put the words in Luke to come forth and write in to Theophilus. Put in Theophilus, because he's the Holy Spirit in him. Is the Holy Spirit in all of this? Put in Theophilus the need to preserve with utmost care and to share as well the words that Luke would have given unto him so that we could have it. So the Lord preserve everything so that despite all the destruction that had taken place, despite all the things the enemy want to do to get rid of the word of God, the truth could not be hidden. So praise be to God. So let's continue. Verse 2. Until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. So see, Jesus did a lot, both during and after his resurrection. So he continued to do the work of the Father up to the point at which he was taken up. And he continues to work. So see, Jesus is not just sitting around on his throne enjoying the view. No. Our king is working. Our king is interceding. Our king is mediating. Let's, let's think about that today when we go through hardship when we face trouble when we have decisions to make let's think about that jesus is our advocate let's live for him let's not allow jesus blood in our life to be all for nothing because let me tell you, his blood is not all for nothing. But you can accept or you can refuse. You accept to your joy. You refuse to your sorrow. So, Jesus did the work physically while he was with us. And then also spiritually, through the Holy Ghost, having ascended, right? Why is it essential to know? It's because we need to know that Jesus is still doing the work. Because we need to understand that it's all about Jesus. It's when we understand it's all about Jesus. So see, the spiritual gifts we have been given, they are not given to us to keep and lock away in our little lives. And be afraid and ashamed to use the spiritual gifts with the Holy Spirit. The spiritual gifts are Jesus' way of 
doing the work of the Father. When you have the gift of healing, it's Jesus' hands being extended to heal the sick. When you have been given the prophetic word, it's Jesus' words, the word of God that's going forth out of your mouth. When you have been given the gift of ministry, it's Jesus' word that's going through your mouth, being preached. When you've been given the gift of teaching, it's Jesus teaching the ways of God, expounding on the word. When you've been given the gift of exaltation, it's Jesus edifying the church through you. It's not about us. It's when we realize it's not about us that we will be better able to utilize our gifts. It has never been about us, ever. Because remember, self is buried. So therefore, we live for Christ. We live for him. Okay? Jesus commanded the disciples. First, he said they should abide in Jerusalem until they receive the gift of the Father, the Holy Spirit, right? He breathed the Holy Spirit upon them. Remember. But this wait he wanted them to wait was for the commission. Right? They had a ministry. They were going to start the church. Right? For the church to be established, we had to have the commission of the holy spirit the baptism of the holy spirit was essential but it goes beyond just the baptism of the holy spirit this one was a special anointing right because the gospel was about to be proclaimed worldwide right not waiting to be proclaimed but going to be proclaimed worldwide right that's what that's what that's what the old spirit on the day of Pentecost was all about the gospel being proclaimed worldwide in every languages right so the apostles haven't been chosen by Jesus Jesus is the one who chose all of them every single one of them right they were given the commandment wait tarry in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit, right? They were told, because this was going to be a special anointing. We know it was going to be a special anointing because they were familiar with the Holy Spirit already. Jesus breathed the Holy Spirit upon them, so they were familiar with the Holy Spirit already. But this time, it was going to be a very special anointing upon their life. Because, you see, the Holy Spirit will give us special anointing for our gifts, but it cannot happen with trivial mindedness. The Holy Spirit will give us special anointing when we have dedication, when we have totally surrendered ourselves, when we are in oneness, in one accord with the will of God then we will be given special anointing outside of the regular anointing of the Holy Spirit. And remember, there's nothing regular about the Holy Spirit's anointing, you know. But what I mean, sp even more special, right? And we will be able to do things that are considered very extraordinary and supernatural. Because it's not about us. It has never been about us. If people are very confused a lot of times about Jesus. But if you are looking for fame and getting a name for yourself. I'm sorry to tell you. In, in the body of Christ, it is always about Christ. It's all about him. 
when we submit ourselves to him when we yield to him when we give him the reverence he will establish us and give us honor but you see the honor is secondary you should not seek after Christ because you want a name for yourself you should seek after him because you want to be with him all the time so this he was talking about here was essential because the Holy Spirit is who helps us to carry out our duties in the body of Christ. As the apostles were given the commandments, we too are given commandments today to abide in Christ. So let's continue. Verse 3. To whom also he show himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Right? So here we are being reminded again that Jesus after his resurrection he continuously show himself to the apostles you see after his resurrection jesus was not just walking amongst the apostles as he used to do before his death right it is not because jesus was a spirit being now and he was a ghost coming and appearing to them and not. No, Jesus was very much alive. He was alive. When he showed up to them, they could feel him. They, he would eat. <laughs> you know, he was alive. He could cook too. <laughs> right? He was alive. It's just that when after the resurrection he was not bound right he was not bound he could go where he want do what he want accordingly as he's accustomed doing anyway right so he was able to appear unto them they were just there talking and he just appeared unto them the real jesus we're talking in <laughs> In his incorruptible body, because his body was never corrupt to begin with. His body has never seen corruption, because he never sinned. So the same body, same body that was pierced with nails, pierced through with the sand, the same body. It is the same body of Jesus that we will see, the same body. Right? Could he heal his body? Yes, he could have healed his body. He could have repaired his body to the point that nothing would be showing but what he wanted the evidence he wanted to bear the signs of his suffering for us because he suffered for us yeah he suffered and died for us you see i want us to remember the suffering see because it's easy for persons to say oh Jesus died for me. Jesus suffered and died for us. The suffering was not no simple matter. He suffered spiritually, physically as well. Right? So we have to understand and remember that. There were many proofs that Jesus was alive and the apostles did share some right case in point he said to Thomas feel me he also told him to give him things to eat because he actually thought he was a ghost too and he cooked for them right so there were proofs there were proofs that he was alive actually alive he was a real person right and thing to note here at the beginning of his ministry jesus was led away by the spirit 
to be tempted 40 days. At the ending of his ministry on earth, because remember, Jesus' ministry has not ended. It will never end. Because Jesus' ministry is not about, oh, just preaching to get some converts. No, Jesus' ministry is about the kingdom. We are a part of the kingdom. We have been adopted into the family of God. So we are kingdom people, right? So as how he started his ministry on earth with 40 days, is ending with 40 days, right? It's not to say, oh, his ministry ended. No. His earthly ministry was going to end. But his heavenly ministry has no end. Take note of this fact. Yeah? So, 40, 40 days are significant. Why? Because 40 days signify persecution, a time of trial and, 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 and suffering. And it also embodies promise. It also embodies a fulfillment right? of the goodness of God, his mercy, and his truth. Right? So... The fulfillment of the 40 days were essential because it had significance to the disciples. See, it's easy to get lost in the details, but it's key for us to note the significance of his 40 days. He spent those 40 days teaching the disciples about the kingdom of God, speaking to them intimate knowledge about the kingdom of god see why is this essential because now they were able to understand now they knew who he really was it's like you know when he was telling them some things before they listened they knew but they did not fully understand or accept now, after his death, burial, and resurrection, having suffered so much, they too suffered alongside him. So they too knew what was taking place. They too had an understanding now of exactly who he is, why he was here, what he requires of them. Because remember now, Jesus was telling them all along. This is what the kingdom of God is like. This is what the kingdom of God is like. Prayer to. Now they understand. Okay. He's the king. The kingdom. The kingdom of God. The kingdom. This is what it's about. The kingdom. <laughs> it's always about the kingdom. So, Jesus had to speak to them concerning the kingdom. Why? Because he knew that his ascension was drawing nigh. You see, because, may not you know, Jesus experienced our life. The life he lived prior to his ministry signified him experiencing every single thing that we experience. The baby stage of helplessness, we were totally dependent on our parents. The innocence of childhood, when we are getting to know our environment. The crazy teenage years, when we are trying to figure out what are these changes in our body. He went through all of that. Right? The, the dawn of adulthood, when you are now expecting to be a functional and mature member of society right he was not joining to be no a part of the world system but he had to go through everything we experienced why is this essential so jesus can intercede for us 
he had to go through it. So when we go and cry to him and say, Jesus, my child, my child is going through puberty and my child is changing on me. He will know, okay, I've been there. I understand what's going on. And he knows the spiritual aspect as well as the physical aspect. It's because kingdom is not you're just from outside looking in. You're a part of the kingdom. He has to take care of you. You see, it's when we realize that this is this is this is an unworthy privilege that we've been given. It's not oh well we deserve it, so no. It's an unworthy privilege. We were not just redeemed. We were brought into the kingdom of God. How I did think we are fought every day. If it was just because we were redeemed, that's one thing and that's one thing. We are not just redeemed. We're redeemed and drawn in to the kingdom of God. A place nobody has ever been allowed before. Think about it. So that's why Jesus had to spend some quality time with them, teaching them about the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God is not just a system. The kingdom of God is everything. We need to know about the Father. We need to know about the Son. We need to know about the Holy Spirit. We need to know about the roles we play. We need to know about what is expected because there are, there are laws and commandments of the kingdom. We need to also know the labor that we have to carry out. We need to also know the penalties for actions. Because our God is a judge. He will judge our actions. So Jesus was teaching them about everything of that nature. And the joys of our salvation. Because what? The kingdom goes on forever. Praise God. See? So they were learning about the kingdom. Right? This is how the apostles, they when they had started in their ministry, they were of the same mind. They all understood the importance and the, the seriousness of the kingdom. They were not guessing at kingdom knowledge. They actually knew kingdom knowledge because Jesus, Jesus had explained to them after his resurrection about kingdom knowledge. So that what they had before is not just what they were operating on. And the thing to note is that they didn't really write about the information that Jesus shared with them in the 40 days. We're not given much information about it. But when we study the individual letters of the apostles, we are able to understand from what they wrote concerning the kingdom knowledge. Because remember now, Jesus was not just meeting with the 12 alone. Jesus was meeting with the, with all his followers, right? Right. There are different times when he would just appear to them and speak with them, right? Those who were real followers of Jesus, they were being given kingdom as well because they're kingdom people. All of us are kingdom people, right? So it's essential for us to realize that we're in a kingdom. We belongs to a kingdom. This is not no no just oh I'm a part of a church. No, you're part of a kingdom. We are the church, but a church is a part of a kingdom. Praise be to God. Hallelujah. So let's continue verse four. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. But wait for the promise of the Father, which said he, ye have heard of me. Right? Now, they were assembled together. Why? Because, see, we have to be of one mind. 
we have to be in fellowship. This is why assembling of the saints is important. Because when we assemble together, we're able to strengthen each other. We're able to help each other out in whatever in whatever capacity or whatever way we have need of help. Yeah. He commanded them because what is the king? He's our king. He gives us the commands, but he's not like early kings who will dictate and put put us in some kind of street and, and, and separate himself in such far position from us we cannot even relate. No. Jesus is our king, but he's also our spouse. You see? It gets very interesting, eh? So there's intimacy. He has to be present. So while they were gathered, he was also gathered with them, in oneness with them, not not exalting himself above, even though he is exalted, but being there, close, in close proximity with them. They felt as one with him. This is essential because, see, a lot of times there are persons who say they don't feel Jesus. Jesus is not just a feeling. Jesus is a person. Jesus is there. In the times when you don't feel him, he's there. Remember, you're part of a kingdom. You're part of a family too. He is there. He is our spouse. Think about it. He's not going nowhere. You can be sure of that. Right? And that's why he was telling them, do not depart from Jerusalem. Why? Because, you see, the, the gospel had to be preached to the Jews first. Why? Be because they are the bearer of the word of God, right? The Jews were given a promise, right? And they kept the promise, even though they've been through a lot, generations of oppression, all kind of, all kind of things. Because the enemy did not make it easy for them. All kind of things they've gone through. But they still kept the faith. Even if it was a few, they still kept the faith. To the point where the, Jesus was able to come, perform his will, according to the Father's will, and defeat the enemy. Right? Now, he's able to bring restoration. But to see, spiritual restoration is important before physical restoration. And that's, this restoration Jesus brought about is the spiritual restoration. That's why they had to stay in Jerusalem. Because the Father gave them the promise that he would pour out the Holy Spirit upon them. See, because of the see, because in our kingdom, the person with the eyes on him is the father. Okay? All consuming, all powerful, almighty, our father. Jesus himself looked up to the father. So we look up to the father too. See, Jesus is our king. Right? We believe in him. We are in oneness with the Father because what? Jesus is in oneness with the Father. So as he is in oneness with the Father, we are in oneness with him. We are also in oneness with the Father. Right? The Father will give us his good and perfect gifts. The Holy Spirit is a promise of the Father to us all. That's why we should daily ask the Father to fill us up with the Holy Spirit. See, remember, the Holy Spirit is dwelling within us. The Holy Spirit 
is part of our life. When we have accepted Jesus, yes, the Holy Spirit is dwelling with us. But you see, the anointing of the Holy Spirit is a special thing. Now, the anointing is the power. You see, you hear the saying, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, that is what is what is the power thereof the anointing so a person will have the holy spirit dwelling within them influencing their life but they're not operating in their gift the holy spirit will preserve them you know the holy spirit will preserve them but to do the will of god they're not doing it why? Because they don't have the anointing. Because we have to ask the Father for the anointing. These are people who, if they are not careful, they will be led astray. Not because the Holy Spirit will lead them astray, but because they have not got the power. They do not have the authority of the Holy Spirit. So, when they are talking in their conversation, they are talking with doubt. They're, they're not even sure of what they believe. And they grieve the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. You, you. We do not want that, eh? Yeah. So as Jesus has spoken about the Father sending the Holy Spirit, he told him, Tarry, wait in Jerusalem for it. Very essential. Because remember, Jerusalem is his place. Jerusalem is his place. So Jerusalem had to rejoice too. Jerusalem had to rejoice. And this was going to be the rejoicing of Jerusalem in the first instance, in the spiritual instance, because the Holy Spirit was going to be poured out in Jerusalem. Right? So let's continue. Verse 5. For John truly baptized with water, but he shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Right? So here Jesus was telling them, John baptized with water, but you have to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Right? He breathed upon them the Holy Spirit. Yes. Not a problem. The Holy Spirit will keep you, will preserve you. But now they have to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. This was a special baptism. Right? This was not just... A baptism that will be for, for the period of Pentecost. But they were permanently baptized with the Holy Spirit. You see, just like, just like after your water baptism, you are saved. You are saved. Right? You believe in Jesus. Truly believe in Jesus. You accept him. You are water baptized. You are saved. The Holy Spirit now baptizes you. Because we have to be what? We have to be baptized with the water and the spirit in order for us to be in the kingdom of God. Remember, it's both. It requires both. So they were not to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you, that baptism was powerful. We are grateful for Pentecost because it's through Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And the mobilization of the apostles that we now have the gospel. You see, a lot of persons put limitation on God and on the Holy Spirit because they don't understand the power of the anointing. The Holy Spirit is not limited by anything. There is nothing to limit the Holy Spirit. So, if we're if if you're given spiritual gifts, and all of us have been given spiritual gift is to figure out what is your gift ask the lord go in prayer and fasting ask the lord to reveal unto you a spiritual gift the lord will reveal unto you and you grow in the spirit i'm telling you the power of the holy spirit unimagined you cannot think Anything that will exhaust the power of the Holy Spirit at all. 
telling you. So let's continue. Verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Now remember, Israel had been given the presence of the Lord. See, you see, what the Lord had established with Israel was his dwelling with them from since the time they were coming out of the land of Egypt into Israel, into the promised land. They were given the tabernacle, right? What the tabernacle signified was God among men, right? That same system will return to Israel, right? The presence of God departed from the temple. Ezekiel prophesied this, right? But what we see now is instead of just the temple, physical temple, the presence of God was to be among us in our spiritual temple. See, because this, this, the, the, the essential part of the kingdom of God that has been established, and this is this is what confused a lot of people, the kingdom of God is established. But they may say, but, but, but we're still under this world system. Hmm. We're under world system physically but we're not under no world system spiritually you know let me explain to you the world system that we see physically is being controlled by the spirits none of those physical human beings that we have as leaders are operating in their own strength they are all being ruled by a spirit they all have to go through rituals to get there. <clears throat> it's when we begin to understand that everything about life is not just what it appears. Then we will begin to understand a lot more better. Right? We had to be freed in the spirit first. P picture this. If Jesus establishes ministry and his kingdom physically, but, but fail to take care of the spiritual aspect, wouldn't it be chaos? Because we will be warring against an invisible enemy, an enemy that does not want to be named, an enemy that has gone through too much lens to take away his very presence from the man of believers. In our world today you know how many believers or I should say people who call themselves believers but they are believers true believers who have still questioned because they have lack of faith you see their faith is very low question if the enemy is real how you think that is possible because the enemy is so disguise and bewitched the world and the enemy sitting up sitting up in our churches preaching in our pulpits shaking hands with us and telling us what to believe and if we're not careful we'll be led astray that's why in the very church there are people who will be led astray because they're weak you see you can come to jesus weak, but you can't stay weak you can't stay weak. We have to grow. We have to grow. So when these disciples were talking about the restoration of the kingdom, they were actually talking about the presence of God returning to Israel and the physical 
manifestation of the power of God. Because see, throughout the the kings of Israel being established and their their operations, they were supposed to represent God's kingdom. Right? A lot of them they were on the devil's side and they did very much wickedness evil in the sight of God. But for the most part, the kingdom of God had been established in Israel, right? At the time, though, it was only in Israel, right? They were chosen people. So they actually were the people of God. They actually are still the people of God, right? The thing, though, is that the people of God has extended beyond Israel, right? Because spiritually, the kingdom of God is in operation. That's the reality. Spiritually, Jesus has conquered the enemy. The enemy has no power to come up against Jesus and the church. Remember, the spiritual kingdom is established already. The spiritual kingdom of Jesus Christ has been established since his suffering, death, burial, and resurrection. Established. See, that's why the enemy never wanted Jesus to make it to the cross. He wanted Jesus to die before. Went through so many lengths to get him to die before. Right? What can we understand? We are the spiritual people of God. Are Israel still the people of God? Yes, because the Lord has called them by his name. So physical Israel is still the people of God. Right? But if they want to be wicked... They will not be saved. So the ones who will yield to the Holy Spirit and accept Jesus, they will become a part of the spiritual kingdom of God. That's the real kingdom of God anyway. Right? But there will be a remnant of Israel that will be preserved by the Lord for his kingdom. He's going to preserve them because they're called by his name. But we need to realize this. Spiritually, we are the people of God. So don't feel like, okay, well, um, I'm not a Jew. I'm not an Israelite. So therefore, I'm not that. No. We are all children of God. Because, see, where is the Israelites were called the people of God. We are the children of God. Because when Jesus suffered, died for us, resurrected for us, we, the believers, through faith, were adopted into the family of God. The family of God was extended towards us. Because remember, when a person obtains a spouse, their spouse becomes a part of the family. You see how serious it is? It's serious. Because we're spouse and we're children at the same time. <laughs> it doesn't make sense in our worldly understanding. But it's not for the world to understand. It's the mystery of God, right? And... As such, they were asking if Israel will be restored, the kingdom of God. That will happen. It will happen. Because when Jesus returns, he is going to return to Jerusalem for his kingdom. It belongs to him. Right? So, we will reign in Jerusalem. We will live in Jerusalem, we will. 
it's our place it belongs to us we're not gonna we're not we're not gonna go there now physically to fight for no place no now we fight in the spirit now we wrestle against principalities powers rulers of darkness spiritual wickedness in high places that we do now physically we're fighting nobody we're living in unity and peace with everyone. You see? It's not about physical. It's about spiritual. That's why it's not about us. So, they were asking a question because even now, the disciples did not understood. Even at this time, the disciples did not understand what Jesus' ministry was about. They understand what he says about the kingdom of God, but they just didn't understand about the physical kingdom of God that they were accustomed to having. Right? So they wanted to know when it will be restored. And it's very interesting because at this time they could not understand much they just couldn't understand because see, see, they understood what Jesus said, but they just could not understand fully why. Because remember, at this time, the disciples did not have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So we have to bear with them at the level they were at at this time. Right? They did not understand the fullness of knowledge. And that will happen to us. Before the Holy Spirit's anointing we will not understand about the ways of god but upon the revelation of the holy spirit through the anointing we will be able to understand the ways of god and the ways of god is not like the ways of man at all right verse 7 and he said unto them it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the father had put in his own power right so let us unpack this now jesus is saying to them it is not for you to know he's not saying to them you will never know right he's just saying to them this is not the time for you to know right they cannot know the ways of God if they don't have the Spirit of God. They cannot understand with the human mind the ways of God without the Spirit of God. Cannot. Because the Spirit is at enmity with the flesh. The flesh is operating in its own way. The Spirit of God operates in the ways of God doesn't have anything to do with no flesh doesn't respond to no flesh doesn't answer to no flesh right and Jesus is explaining to them the father has his own power you see Jesus tells us everything you know but sometimes we don't understand there is a reason why Jesus says acts of the father right because of the power of the father the reality of the matter is in the godhead the father is the highest authority the father is the highest authority he is all powerful what the father has done he has given all power and authority unto jesus Right? He has given all unto Jesus. Does that mean that Jesus was not powerful for himself? No. But it signifies how much the Father loves him and honors him. Right? So Jesus is trying to explain to them, you cannot understand the times nor the seasons of my Father because you don't yet have the power the Holy Spirit is the power he was talking about here. You don't understand. You cannot understand because you don't have the power. 
Only the Father have the power for you to understand. Because that's why Jesus said to us, ask the Father for the Holy Spirit. There's a reason why we have to ask the Father in the name of Jesus for the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the power of the Father. You see, it's very essential for us to understand. It's not the Holy Spirit that's dwelling, the Holy Spirit that's dwelling within us is not for sure. The Holy Spirit that's dwelling within us is all powerful, almighty, will obliterate everything that's unholy. Right? So let's continue verse 8. But he shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit is come upon you, and he shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Right? So, the power from the Father will, we will receive through the Holy Spirit. Right? Because the Father is going to bless us, you know. As he promised, he will bless us. He, he will bless us. And he continually bless us through his Holy Spirit. Because remember, that's why Jesus keeps teaching. God is a spirit. You must worship him in spirit and in truth. In spirit because he's a spirit. In truth because he is truth. He cannot stand lies ever. Right? Now, the Holy Spirit is the one who will be able now. You see, we have to receive the Holy Spirit. Why is this essential? Holy Spirit will be sent. But if we don't receive him, he cannot come in. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is not going to barge into your life and take up position. You have to receive the Holy Spirit. Yes, pray to the Father. Ask the Father for the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. Pray believing to receive. Faith is essential. Faith is essential in everything we do. Right? So, when the Holy Spirit comes to us, the Holy Spirit will let us know it's Him. The Holy Spirit will identify Himself. And the Holy Spirit will identify Himself by what? Talking about Jesus. Right? All day, every day, the Holy Spirit will testify about Jesus. All day, every day. Right? You're doing something wrong, the Holy Spirit will remind you. This is not doing honor to Jesus. That's how you know you're sinful. That's how you know you, that's how you know you have sinned. The Holy Spirit will tell you this is not honorable to Jesus. What's the, what's the next thing to do? Stop and get yourself into the way to honor Jesus. Why? Because the, the Holy Spirit was the Holy Spirit is the one who will help us to preach the gospel unto everyone. Right? The gospel was supposed to be preached in Jerusalem first. Right? The disciples are the witnesses of Jesus. They have witnessed his life. They have lived with him. They have walked with him. Eaten with him. All kind of thing. Right? They had also witnessed his suffering. His death. His burial. His resurrection. And is essential. So, so, so you see, they are witnesses. They are able to tell the truth concerning him. And everybody who knew Jesus knew his apostles. They see them going all about doing things together. So when they when they stand up to speak about him, they are true witnesses of Jesus, right? And they were going to speak of what they have witnessed in Jerusalem first. Then the gospel had to be preached in all Judea. Why? Because 
the gospel had to be preached to all the Jews first. Right? It was essential that the gospel be preached unto all the Jews first before anybody else. Why? Because they were and are still the people of God. People of God. Right? Called by his name. Right? Having accepted Jesus, they become children of God. There's a difference, you know. There's a very big difference. A lot of us don't seem to realize the difference. Then in Samaria, why is Samaria important? Because Jesus had already started a ministry in Samaria. But you see, because he was not sent to the Samaritans because they were mixed people, they were not able to get the fullness of the gospel as yet. They got some amount of it, but they were still hungry. So they had to preach to Samaria. Right? We are all spiritually the children of God. It's more important for us as children than people even because we are not that distance from the Father. We are very, very close with the Father. We are in oneness with Him. Right? It's essential for us to know. From Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria, then to the rest of the world. Why? Because the Gentiles, as they were called. Right? All the world were called Gentiles outside of Judea and Samaria. Why Samaria would be included is because they were mixed. Samaritans were basically partly Jew and partly all, all kind of a mixture. They were mixed up, right? They occupied a part of the northern kingdom, right? They have a long history of bitterness with the Jews. Right? Because the Jews did not consider them to be true Israelites, which they were mixed, so they were not really true, neither. They did not serve Yahweh with truth. They worship all kind of other they worship all kind of other God. Their worship was mixed. And you know, if the worship is mixed, it's not it's not honorable to God. He will not accept it. Mm -mm. So that's why the Jews had enmity with them. But Jesus loved them. Jesus loved them. Jesus also nationality, you know. All, it, all belongs to him. He doesn't say nationality. He's the savior of the world. Everybody. That's why the gospel has to be preached to the entire world. It's essential to, to realize that. Right? The entire world earth had to receive the gospel of jesus christ the only way we're able to preach the gospel to the world the entire earth is through the holy spirit think about it through the holy spirit right so the baptism was essential so let's continue verse 9 and when he had spoken these things while they beheld he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. So Jesus, having ascended, he was there talking to them. And having spoken that to them, he was now taken up while they were looking at him. So you see, this time the, the disciple understood that him being taken up while they look at him because otherwise he would just appear and, and then disappear. But now they were looking at him, beholding him, going up. They understood. This is it. This is goodbye for now. Yeah. But he was not going to be gone spiritually. Spiritually, the kingdom has been established. 
So of course we're gonna be uh, we're gonna be talking to our king spiritually, but physically you understood. Okay, this was goodbye for now. Yeah. So a cloud received them out of their sight. Why? Because you see, Jesus is going home to heaven to be with the Father. So the cloud will receive him. Why? Because see, the, the clouds, he rides the clouds. They transport. They are basically his chariot. They, they transport him. He rides them. Yeah? The same way the father does. <laughs> so, having received him, and why you think they, and why you think the clouds receive him and obscure him from the aspect from the apostles because you see they had to be shielded from the power of God from the the glory that was gonna come out as he ascended because you see when op when heaven opened to receive him the glory of God is gonna shine forth the cloud had to obscure to protect them because remember still they had not gotten the baptism of the holy spirit god will shield us god will shield us god will shield us from himself to protect us for his own namesake take note of that so even in this moment whether we're beholding jesus going up and the cloud come up and take him up they realize he's gone it's it's heartbreaking because they know they will miss him but you see Jesus prepared his disciples for his departure he did and they understood that it's not that he's gone forever he's gonna be with them spiritually always just as how he is with us spiritually now always right but we know to physically see him very few people would ever physically see jesus very very few right and even if they, they physically see jesus there are those who he will not appear to them entirely like they will see his glory, but they will not behold him entirely. Right? Most people who have given their encounter with Jesus, they will not have descriptions that could be explained in human words because the human man cannot understand the spiritual things. Right? So just as just like that, when we are changed, then we're gonna behold our King. Beautiful, I'm telling you, beautiful. The Spirit knows, so the Spirit will let us know. He is beautiful, beautiful. So let's continue. Verse ten. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them. In white apparel so while they were standing there looking at Jesus steadfastly going up yeah even after he ascended and he was gone clearly they was clearly they see he was gone they were still looking up right they were still looking up in heaven because you see it's so real is 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 really gone for real and they were looking up because they must have been wondering is he gonna appear again but they some somehow they would have known that this is it so just the, just the just the fact that they were in the moment they did not want to leave in a hurry 
it's not easy, you know. It's not easy to say goodbye to the persons we love, much less our Savior. The way they understood Jesus' sacrifice for us was ever present in their mind at this time. So it was very hard for them to say goodbye. Very hard. But they were in awe. They were in amazement. And they were still looking. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. So two men stood by them in white apparel. So we know these two men were angels. How we know they were angels? They are described as two men. Angels will appear like men. They will appear like us. But we will know that there's, well, not all the time, because some people entertain angels and don't even know. But they will appear like us. Here, they're in white apparel. And they were standing by the disciples. No. The disciples did not see when they come. They disappear. They were not startled neither. Because what? They are accustomed to angels by now. Having encountered angels at the resurrection of Jesus, they are accustomed to angels by now. Right? Plus, the people of Israel were accustomed to angels overall. They were aware that the angels were the messengers of God, so they were aware of them. You see, the spiritual place they were at, they were not going to be afraid. Before, they would have wondered if it's a ghost. But that angels look like men was to take away any fear they would have, which they didn't have none. They were aware of who they were because they had matured. It's the maturity that, that is taking place now, you know. Jesus had just left them. They're still standing there. The angels were sent to them to do what? To lend comfort. Because remember, before the Holy Spirit came, the angels were the messengers of God to basically come and tell us. So if we had to be told any instructions, the angels would bring the news to us. The Holy Spirit was not accessible to everyone prior to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on, on, on the day of Pentecost, right? So because they were there standing, looking up, the angels came to them, right? And they were standing there with them too in solidarity because remember, they are on our side. They are with us. We are on the same team, right? So, let's continue. Verse 11, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as he have seen him go into heaven. See? This is courtesy of the Father, right? You see, the Father is so loving to us that he knows the state of man these disciples were in. They have given three and a half years of their life to Jesus, right? They had given him everything. They abandoned family, career, and they served. Right? Now that he was taken up, they were just still stuck there, gazing up. Still gazing up. Right? All of them were doing the same thing. Simply mean they were of one accord. Right? And the angels appeared there. They were standing there, physically standing there, just like looking like one of them, but they were in, they were looking like men. 
And they were saying, he men of Galilee, because what did, all the disciples were from Galilee, except for Judas Iscariot, who, you know, he's no longer. So it was just, it was just the 11, along with the other followers of Jesus. So, so the disciples, having witnessed Jesus' ascension, were there looking up still and the angels were like this same jesus that you've seen as as you've seen him ascended this is the same way he will descend right as you've seen him go up into heaven and he, and they are telling them where jesus has gone not that Jesus didn't tell these disciples already that he's from heaven and he's going to go back. He, 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 he's been saying it. They knew where he was going, but still it's comforting to know, you know, that the angels were telling them again, reminding them, he has gone to heaven. He will descend the same way how he ascended. Comfort, eh? Comfort. Basically, stop gazing up into heaven. Because see, they were gazing up into heaven. Gazing up into heaven. Hmm? The heaven they were gazing up into, you know, is not that heaven was open and they were seeing heaven. <laughs> it's our first heaven they're talking about. Okay? They were still looking up. But Jesus is already gone. So, the angels were basically telling them, he will appear just as though you see him go up, he will come down. Yeah? This was a bit comforting for them. And also, it will break the gazing fixation they had <laughs> to bring them back to their purpose right so let's continue verse 12 then return they unto jerusalem from the mount called olivet which is from jerusalem a sabbath day's journey so they were there on mount olivet now remember zachariah in zachariah 14 gave vivid details about Jesus second coming on the Mount of Olivet there will be an earthquake and it will create a valley for the, 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 the children of Israel to run into and be saved yeah because the Lord will always deliver his people you know he will always deliver his people because his wrath will not fall upon his people so the same way Jesus' ascension took place on the Mount Olivet, the same way Jesus' descension at his second coming will take place on the Mount Olivet because Jerusalem is our place. It is our place. And the king will return. You see, when the king returns, his duty as our high priest would be done, meaning he would have interceded, mediated for us, and the time has come. Then he will be coming as our king, our mighty warrior. It will not be an easy time for the, for the, for the devil, no? He will be bound in chains and cast into the pit. Praise be to God. Looking forward to that day. Yeah, so looking forward most especially for our beautiful king, his return, his loving kindness towards us all will be on display, his mighty splendor, mm, all his power, his sovereignty will be undeniable.
praise God. So, a Sabbath day's journey is about um, a little less than a mile. Yeah, it's not very far because remember, all of it is right across from Jerusalem, so it's not very far. They are they are accustomed going over there, right? Mount Olivet was Jesus' place for a lot of things. He went to pray there. He went to preach there. Jesus claimed Mount Olivet as his own place. We have a stronghold there. Mount Olivet is a spiritual stronghold for the saints. Right? It's the mount of our king. Right? He made it that way. Anybody could go and take it over. So, let's understand that very well. Huh? Let's continue verse 13. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotus, and Judas the brother of James. So here he lists the eleven disciples, right? But take note, the, the 11 apostles were listed here, but they were not the only persons who were present when Jesus ascended, right? All the persons who went to see Jesus ascended were with the disciples or without all the persons who went to see Jesus ascended were with the other or with the 11 apostles right they were staying in one place right this is essential to note because see they were waiting on the Holy Spirit to arrive Right? So they were all staying in one place. Because what they are in one accord. Right? So these eleven haven't been with Jesus for so long. Haven't given up everything for him. They were now waiting for the promise of the Father. Praise be to God. Right? And they were all waiting with the other disciples so let's continue verse 14 these all continued in one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and mary the mother of jesus and with his brethren right so they continued in one accord take note one accord they were all of the same mind and purpose and they continued in prayer and supplication why because it's very essential they were asking the father to send the promise of the holy spirit does it mean the father would not have sent unless they asked no the father is gonna send the holy spirit but they were continuing in prayer why is this essential because see they are following what jesus did they are following what jesus commanded See, it's one thing when he's with us, physically with us. They would have normally depended on him to pray, to cover them. See, Jesus taught the apostles to pray now. But I don't think they hardly ever do. Because most of the time, it was Jesus by himself praying. He tell them to come pray with him, they end up fall asleep. They were not, they were so relax because he was around they know he would cover them but they could pray because he, 
he taught them to pray. So now that he is gone, I've been ascended, they were going to pray because what prayer is the connection. Prayer is how they communicate with him. Just like how we communicate with him through prayer. Prayer is our communication. You see, you want to contact somebody in our world, you go on the phone. You make a phone call or you go into social media. Well, prayer is our social media. Prayer is our phone. Yeah, that's how we talk to Jesus. We go before our God, the Father, and we make our supplications. Supplications are not just making a set of requests. We are basically submitting everything to the Father and ask him of him of all our supplies doesn't mean physical supplies alone spiritual supplies as well inclusive of the holy spirit right take note the women of the ministry were also present because see they did not leave out the women because the women had abandoned their life too the women had made the women had made their life all about Jesus. So having witnessed Jesus' ascension, they all gathered in the same place. The women were there too. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there too, along with his brothers and sisters. Right? You see, it is clear that Joseph would have died at this time. Because if Joseph had not died, he would have been here with her. But clearly he would have died at this time because only Mary and the, the siblings were there. Now, we do know that Jesus' siblings were, they were adults for the most part, right? There were four brothers and he had sisters as well. Um, it's not clear how many sisters he had, but he had sisters as well, right? And they were all, they were all from Mary and Joseph's marriage. Mary was their mother. There is this misconception, this lie of the devil, this doctrine of Satan that has been propagated and continuously parading in in, in, in the form of truth that Mary was a perpetual virgin that's not true it's not of God neither it goes against what the Bible teaches us as well right because the Bible is teaching us that Mary and his brethren Mary and the brother and sisters of Jesus right Jesus had brothers and sisters Right? Yes, Joseph was not his father, but Mary was his mother. That's how they become his brethren. And you see, they were separate and apart from his apostles and the women who were serving. They were his family. You see, because by now his family believed in him. Having witnesses suffering death, burial, and resurrection, they now accepted him. They realized who he was. You could see a little too late. But still, it's never too late with God, eh? Praise be to God. So they realized Mary has always known. So Mary has always been a devout believer of Jesus. Imagine. That you would raise your own savior. She was a devout believer. Mary is not blasphemous. She was a humble woman. Submitted unto God. So Mary would not accept no worship either. Mary worshipped the Lord, her God. She did not have them up in the upper room worshipping her. 
right? She was also given by Jesus into the care of John, right? So John was in charge of her affairs in the absence of Jesus, right? But she was a devout believer of Jesus, and you best believe she was a part of the discipleship. And take note, she was in the upper room. So take note, the Holy Spirit, the anointed of Jesus, baptized Mary as well. Eh? Mary was baptized with the Holy Spirit as well because she was up in the upper room. She, along with his brother and sisters, think about it. You see? Jesus' entire family was there. What a beautiful, beautiful moment when his family can now be partakers of the grace of God. Praise be to God. Right? So Jesus' entire family was set in order before he left. Praise be to God. And as the eldest child, he would set them in order. He didn't have to do much neither because they believe. That is what is essential. Yeah. So there they were, continuing in prayer and supplication in one accord. They were all of the same mind. So they were all praying together, praising together, worshiping together, all believers of Jesus Christ. Praise be to God. Let's continue. Verse 15. In those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, The number of names together were about an hundred and twenty. So Peter stood up in the midst to talk. We know that Peter is given a special assignment in the church. He was appointed as the spokesperson of the church because the word of God came to Peter. I see the Lord will use the same thing the devil wants to use to destroy you. The Lord wants to use to bless you. Take note of the areas in your life that the enemy attacks the most. Take note. You see the area of your life that the enemy attacks the most? That's where the anointing of God is is targeting in your life take note the very thing that ever want to destroy in your life that's where the lord want to increase in your life for peter it was his mouth the fact that he could speak the fact that his speech were powerful impactful left an impression right the devil wanted to destroy him, to use him for filth, but Jesus wanted to bless him, right? So he was to be the mouthpiece of the church, right? So, so he stood up in the midst of them, all 120 of them in the upper room, and he spoke. Now, remember now, the upper room, the upper room was not such a big, big place. But it's because they were all waiting on the Holy Spirit to come. They did not leave the upper room. They continued steadfastly in prayer. Right? They did not care about comfort anymore. All they desire was the Holy Spirit. Praise be to God. Would that in our day and age we could be of the same mind. Let's continue. Verse 16. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. So see, Peter is not ready. He's not ready to start talking. But Take note. All that Peter was speaking was 
not just empty words. His words were powerful, impactful, guided by God too. So here he was giving some encouragement to the disciples, telling them, reminding them, drawing their attention to the fact that the scripture had to be fulfilled concerning Judas. Because see, that matter of Judas was still a sore spot. Was still a sore spot. The apostles had to forgive Judas. The disciples in a whole had to forgive Judas. Why? Because... It is essential. Jesus himself forgive him. What to tell you? It is essential. Peter is also pointing out that David, who was also anointed with the Holy Spirit when he when he prophesied, because David was a prophet of the Lord, you know. David prophesied a lot of things concerning Jesus' life. A lot. So David spoke concerning Judas as well, who was the betrayer. David spoke about him at length, let me tell you. I believe David spoke about Judas more than anybody else. Yeah. David described his character. David described what would become of him David described the treachery of his action. David described him very well. Mm -hmm. So when Peter starts to talk about the scriptures now, it's to bring comfort for them, as well as to remind them of the authority of our God. The fact that he could see, he knows everything. He knows what would happen. Nothing is hidden from him. How great is our God. So let's continue. Verse 17. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. So see, Judas was a part of the twelve. He was chosen by Jesus. He was numbered among them. He himself received part of the ministry of Jesus. Right? Notice part of right it's not to say judas never never learn nothing else it's not to say judas never get exposure to the ministry of jesus judas was a part of the ministry of jesus and still judas betrayed jesus you see if he was an absentee disciple who were there some days and gone the other days, it would have been better not so bad. Yes, there were times when he had to do things for Jesus which would require him to go places and do things. But at the same time, it did not diminish nor take away the fact that he was a part of the ministry. Right? It was never revealed to us at what point in time Judas started doing his own thing, but it was clear, based on how Jesus described him, he was very much a person who was operating his own will, right? He did not understand the things of God. Sad to say. Yeah? Jesus was there telling him, teaching him too, as he does all, all the other disciples. And Judas was just, he just come to one ear, go to the next. He did not take it in at all. Not at all. But now that he had betrayed Jesus, he himself hung himself, commit suicide, which is not something that people should do. Because our life is not our own. But he had gone to such lengths, taking his life. It is important for them, the disciples, to understand and analyze the death of Judas and analyze the fact that he had lost his place among them. 
right? So, so there were there was a space to be filled, right? Verse eighteen. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. Now here was Peter describing the, the death of Judas. Right? Judas clearly purchased a field, right? With the wages of iniquity, right? His reward of iniquity. Peter is not here saying that Judas bought a field with 30 pieces of silver. Take note of that. Remember, Judas was a thief. Judas was a thief. Right? So, he purchased a field for himself. Right? After he betrayed Jesus, he went back to the temple to return the 30 pieces of silver. He threw them down in the temple and walked away. He went onto his own field that he bought with money that he was stealing. That's what he, that's what he means by reward of iniquity. You know? Judas was stealing. He was a thief. Now, walking through his own property that he has stolen, it's not lost. The irony that he was even able to own a field because he stole the money he would have been in charge of keeping while Jesus' ministry was taking place. Even the very field is a reminder of Jesus. So he walked into his field. We know from Matthew's account that he hung himself. So clearly, he was being tormented of the enemy too. So he clearly went to hang himself. It is not clear if he was hanging himself and then in the process of hanging himself, he fell down. But clearly, based on Peter's account, he was falling headlong. Right? Now, there are things that are made clear. He fell headlong. Right? His property must have been overlooking the valley. Right? The same valley that Jeremiah prophesied about. Right? His having fallen headlong, he burst open, meaning his belly erupted. Right? And his intestines came out. Right? That's the manner of death Judas suffered. Right? No doubt he was hanging himself. And some mishap take place and he fall down and burst open in the valley. Because, remember... After he would have left the money with the leaders in the temple, he then went on about his business. Right? They then went and purchased the valley and called it the potter's field. But it's the field of blood. They purchased the place because it is the money of iniquity. Judas was always an iniquity worker. Judas was always stealing. And he betrayed Jesus for money. So that's the wages of iniquity too. It is easy for someone to not understand how these two accounts correlate instead of contradict each other clearly judas bought a field 
for himself from stealing from Jesus and he also had a field purchased for him by the leaders with the money they would have given him to betray Jesus. Let's continue. Verse 19, And it was known unto all the dwellers of Jerusalem, in so much as that field is called in their proper tongue, Akel Dama, that is to say, the field of blood. Right? So, Judas happened to fall headlong and had his bowels gushed out. He ended up in what is called a caldema. See, a caldema is on a hill, which is why I believe that Judas' property was above, above the valley. Prime place too, to have bought a property. He would have made himself very wealthy because land was money. Back in those days, land was money. Even in today's days, land is still money. He did not inherit nothing. Rather, he was brought on untimely debt because of his gross action. The place he ended up dying in, they, they end up calling Akeldema or the field of blood. Because you see, Judas having fallen down the way he did, the leaders who know things, who most likely would know how to meet him, and who most likely know where he's from and where he's going. No information about him. Most likely would have gone and swiftly made a purchase of the place. They would not move his body. Because they would not want to make themselves unclean. You see, because the fact that he killed himself was a shameful act. That alone is bad. Right? They would purchase the place because they would not want to even move him. Because a curse would come upon them too. They would not want no, no association with his death. So you see, Judas really got the bitter end of the stick. So let's continue. Verse 20, for it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate and let no man dwell therein. And his vicious brick, let another take, right? So, Judas was fulfilling the prophecy of David, yeah? That his habitation shall be desolate. And it was, and it is, still to this day it is. Nobody really dwells there. It's a dump. A place of desolation. Right? Nobody dwells there. He has lost his place in the ministry as well. So somebody else has to take it up. You see, because Jesus... Jesus called Judas, but Judas didn't want nothing to do with Jesus, eh? Judas was all in it for what he could get. Greed and selfish ambitions got the best of him. We have a lot of Judas in our world today, no? What do we do? Pray for them. Pray the Lord will have mercy on them. So, Judas was fulfilling prophecy. Right? So let's continue. Verse 21. Wherefore of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. See, Peter was very careful to point out that Jesus is Lord. Right? 
So he was referring to the men who had been with Jesus, who had also accompanied them, right? He was beginning to address the disciples on a whole to let them pick of the men who had accompanied Jesus, right? This is essential because, you see, the person who had to fill Judas' role has to be chosen, right? So Peter, being guided as well, spiritually guided, was acting on behalf of what was required. Let's continue, verse 22. Beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. This was essential. They had to choose a person who was there from Jesus' baptism to his ascension, someone who would have in a sense bear witness of his resurrection. Right? This is essential because remember the twelves were chosen by Jesus. Now that there needs to be a replacement, this replacement has to be chosen by Jesus. Take note, Peter gave the criteria, somebody who has been there since his baptism to his ascension. What does that mean? All Jesus' disciples were there. From his baptism right through right he walked with them he, 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 he performed miracles with them he was there for them so even though he was always with the twelve it was not just the twelve alone who were disciples of Jesus there are others who were there too and even some of John disciples became his disciples too so take note of that, the fact that the disciples walk with Jesus from his baptism quite to his ascension. Right? So, we are seen here where Peter is saying one of them must be ordained. This means that they had to be appointed to become a witness, right? And it had to be one person. Now, you may be wondering, well, how is it that they're going to choose this one person? And in fact, it's not their choice to make. It's Jesus' ministry. So he has to make the choice for them. So you may ask yourself, well, why is it that they never just have Jesus choose this person while he was around? It's because... God works in mysterious ways. He has to demonstrate to them the authority of his power. Yeah? Let's continue. Verse 23. And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justus and Matthias. Right? So, as they've mentioned, the criteria for the replacement apostle, they appointed two persons. So they were careful to look amongst themselves and choose two persons, right? They only needed one though. So there had to be some kind of method for the choice to be made. Because I'm sure that both men were very eager to serve. Not much information is given about these two disciples of Jesus, right? But what we can be sure of is that they were there for his entire ministry. Praise be to God. Yeah. So let's continue. Verse 24. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knoweth the hearts of all men, Shew whether of these two thou hast chosen. 
see they prayed take note when you have to make major decisions in your life particularly concerning the gift of god and his purpose you have to pray about it you have to so they didn't just choose them and that's it they prayed right and this is the nature of the prayer notice how they are praying they are praying in such a manner that they require that the Lord will choose the person. They are acknowledging the fact that the Lord knows the heart of all men. Right? So they are expecting the Lord who knows the heart of all men to choose who, which of the two, should be the, the, the chosen one to replace Judas. Right? It's because it's all about Jesus. You don't just take up yourself and choose and make decisions. No. It's all about Jesus. Right? So, here we have the disciple to be chosen. And they are beseeching the Lord to choose. You see, they have faith in Jesus. So remember, Jesus always chastising them and saying, Oh, you have little faith. Right? Now, while he's not there, they have to have faith in him that he will choose for them. They believe he will choose for them. Right? So, verse 25, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place right so this speaks towards the fact that they needed jesus to choose one of the two men so that he could participate in the ministry and apostleship because it's essential that it's 12 of them you see peter was being influenced here by the holy spirit while he was not yet baptized by the holy spirit he was being influenced by the holy spirit because the relative of the matter is, of all the disciples gathered, Peter was the one who had more exposure with the Holy Spirit before the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because see, Peter believed in him. Peter had firm belief in him. Peter was a believer, man. So, he was following the Holy Spirit's guidance in appointing someone to replace Judas. Right? Because prophecies had to be fulfilled. Right? Also, Jesus called 12. His ministry is centered on the 12. The 12 is important because the 12 represents the tribe of Judah. Were each apostle taken from a tribe of Judah? No. But... They represent the church, right? And we can't be missing one. Not because he's a transgressor and he fall down to go to his own place, meaning he decided to do his own thing. He had selfish ambitions. They were supposed to have abandoned their lifestyle for Jesus. Judas not only kept living how he wanted to, he even had the audacity to go betraying the Holy Begotten Son of God. For a measly 30 pieces of silver. The whole greedy and senseless Judas became in. Very, very interesting. So you see, it became very necessary. Judas had to be replaced. Must, not if, not must. Had to be. Had to be replaced. Yeah. So... Verse 26 and last, and they gave for their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. This, this lot that they gave for it, this was a way of making major decisions with the Lord. See? They would cost a lot, but the Lord is the one who decided.
main purpose of this very study is on this verse. The Holy Spirit revealed unto me that the Urim and the Thummim, you can read more about this Urim and Thummim in Exodus 28 verse 30, right? The Urim and the Thummim were given by the Lord to be instruments of judgment. So when the Lord had to make a judgment, these were used, right? Because what they would do, they would always ask a question of the Lord. And then they would cast the lots and then the answer from the Lord will be displayed, right? Meaning, if the urine was cast, it's an answer. And if the terminus cost, it's an answer, right? Now, the Holy Spirit revealed unto me that just as, just as the Urim and the Thummim are instruments of God's judgment, meaning you ask a question, you get an answer through this means. Our enemy has copied the system in the Ouija board right our enemy has been busy using the various instruments of fate to give him ideas and to make instruments of unrighteousness that have similar function but for evil purposes you see, the enemy has so made this become commonplace that you will have young people going and buying Ouija board and sitting around it and asking questions to their own earth. Take note, they were here causing lots. But they were not gambling. This was a divine judgment needed. This was before the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Because this was before the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is who would give the answer. Anyway, when these lots were cast. Right? We don't have to be casting lots as Christians anymore. All we need to do is yield to the Holy Spirit. They cast the lots, but the Lord is who gives the answer. Because they asked the Lord who, and the Lord chose Matthias. There's a reason why the Lord chose Matthias. Because he is the one. See, the Lord searched the heart. He knew whose heart was fully in. No disrespect to just us. But Matthias was all in for Jesus. All along. And he was chosen. We could never fully understand the ways of our God. But we can be sure of this one thing. Let's not go seeking answers that we need from God. Through the instruments of unrighteousness. Let us also be aware of the devil's devices so that we will not be caught up in evil schemes because since the revelation of God came about this Urim and Thummim, these judgment stones being copied by the enemy in the Ouija board, I have gotten a conviction that I must talk about it. My intention was to do it in the Bible study for Exodus 28, but 
I was directed also to come here for the Acts of the Apostles. I chose this one because I wanted us to see it in action because in Deuteronomy 28, the, the details about what exactly, how you use it was not stated. Now I'm not saying that these were the same you remember them in that the that Aaron and the even David used, even Joshua used, I'm not saying, but it was the same principle behind it, seeking divine judgment, seeking divine knowledge about a question you have, what the Lord has to answer. Right? This this system of casting lots and seeking divine judgment has been copied and profaned by the enemy. One too many times we have possibly watched a video or even heard about a person receiving some very vicious things being done to them or to those around them after engaging in seeking judgment from a Ouija board. They go asking the Ouija board all kind of question and they get answers but but along with those answers come consequences. I am warning young people especially you may have questions for the Lord. You may have questions for Jesus that are not questions that you can easily ask just about anyone. You may have questions for Jesus that are very personal. Ask Jesus your questions. Wait patiently for the Lord to answer you. He will answer you. Ask believing that you will receive and you will receive. However, do not go seeking the devil's devices to get the Lord's answers. It's not how the Lord works. Here, the apostles cast a lot, but they cast a lot in the name of the Lord. But the lots they were casting, I'm trying to point out the lots they were casting were the means of which the divine judgment were given, the Urim and the Thummim. That's what they were casting, right? Not in the same principle that the priests used them. Because even Joshua, when Joshua used them, he was using them to divide the land for the, for the inheritance of the children of Israel. That's how he used them, right? Here, the disciples were using them to decide on which of the two men were to be a replacement of Judas. They were only using the urine and tumming, which the Holy Spirit was the one who basically helped them to get the answer. Right? But they were only using the urine and the tumming, casting lots, because they were not yet baptized by the Holy Spirit. Having Receive the Holy Spirit, having established the church of Jesus Christ, we continue to be given the Holy Spirit by the Father. We do not then need to cast no lots. If we have questions for the Lord, let us go to the Lord in prayer. He will answer us. Notice after this time when they cast lots, they never had to do so again. Yet disciples were very empowered. They had been given answers. The Holy Spirit has provided them with knowledge and understanding and discernment. Yeah. They were able to know what people were thinking. Similar to when Jesus would know what people were thinking. They were also able to know intimate details that were not normal unless you know it you would not know it the Holy Spirit reveals you see the enemy will copy the ways of God 
Some people will be seduced by evil to be lured in. But do not be lured in because you cannot convert a Ouija board. You cannot sanctify it. You cannot make it to do spiritual things that are honorable to God. It is demonic. Do not go dabbling in with it. You see, I was just asking the Lord a morning when I was fasting to speak to me today and immediately that request was made this dropped into my spirit the Urim and the Thummim are God's instruments that the devil has copied for the Ouija board no that was not even my thought but it dropped in my thought. Immediately I asked the Lord to speak to me that time. I said, wow, this is interesting. You know what happened? I came home and I started to research about the Urim and the Thummim because it's so interesting because Urim and Thummim, I barely, briefly brushed past them in, 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 um, in reading the Bible. So I, I, I was like, I am at a loss. What is this your mentoring? Let me go understand it. And I think in my ignorance, in my thirst to get wisdom and knowledge, I was just automatically going and reading on net. So while I was there, I must have read a, a good portion, but I was not getting much place. I was trying to understand. Well, how is it that nobody's making a correlation? Because I would see, in my ignorance, I was looking to see a correlation that anybody have, have made that correlation before that the devil has warped the significance of the human term in, into the Ouija board for, for, for demonic influence and for demonic spirits to speak to people. And I could not find anything like that. And then the Holy Spirit convicted me by saying that I gave you what you asked for. You, you asked to be spoken to. You asked for knowledge. Gave you knowledge. And you go seeking to find if it's true to verify. I was so convicted because, you know, that was true. You see, sometimes we do things we don't even realize. Why I'm sharing my embarrassing moment is because I want us to realize this. The Lord speaks to us. The things the Lord says to us may not be things that are acceptable of the world, nor things that are easily understood by the world, but the Lord has spoken. Therefore, let what the Lord says be true, and every other man will lie. I myself personally have no experience with Ouija board that I can say. I've never used one. Oddly, if I even know how to recognize one, except maybe the name is there on it. But I'm being cautioned. Know this, that that is what they copy. The instrument of God was copied into a very demonic thing. I don't know if this is for someone. It seemed very strange that I would get this knowledge because I don't even use the thing. If you have something, it's not a personal conviction. But it's good to know. But I know it's not for me. I don't know if it's for someone. If it's for someone, I pray that you will yield to the Holy Spirit, trust in the Lord, and wait for him to answer you. He will answer you. He will speak to you. I am telling you, immediately I asked the Lord to speak with me. While I was fasting that day, the Lord spoke to me without, without missing a beat.
It's like I just say something now and then the Lord answered. Just like that. And it was not no long lintany of, of thing. The, the the very thing that came was the Urim and the Thummim are copied by the enemy in the Ouija board. That's it. And I was just alone. And you know, going throughout the day, I was thinking about it in the morning period because in the morning period is when I got it. I was thinking about it, but I had forgotten it. When I reached home, I, it came back to memory. And I was tasked to do a Bible study on it, but I just couldn't understand the information until I go reading. And I was led to the scripture to find it. I read about the first bit of judgment. I followed through to how Joshua cast the lots. I followed through to how David would make inquiries of the Lord should he go to battle or not. I followed through and I followed through all the way to this account in Acts where they cast the lots. This is the last account of the lots being cast in the Bible. And I just want to say the Lord is good. He's worthy to be praised. He knows everything. He knows who needs this information. And if you are the person who needs this information, then be warned. The Ouija board is not of God. The devil has copied the Urim and Thummim. But do not be fooled. You cannot get divine knowledge and divine answers by using the devil's instrument. Speak to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will answer us. Okay? So, as we go through it today, let us reflect on the ascension of Jesus. Let us reflect on the fact that the disciples, before their baptism of the Holy Spirit, they were in one accord. Before their baptism of the Holy Spirit, you know, they were in one accord. In prayer and supplication, in one. How much more should we be in oneness, having been baptized by the Holy Spirit? Oneness is important. Even Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there, along with his brothers and sisters. So let us remember, oneness is important. Right? The, the folly of Judas cannot be ignored. It is very sad that his greed and his selfish ambitions led him to that dark place. But we have to remember we are not immune to the sinful nature. So let's be mindful and to trust in the Lord because the Holy Spirit is our guide. We can speak to the Lord anytime through prayer. Let us pray always without ceasing. And when we pray to the Lord for an answer, let us wait. He will speak to us. As sure as I'm speaking to you now, the Lord will speak to you. Sometimes he speaks to you through the word of God Sometimes he speaks to you through sending someone. What is this, angel? Is that you confirm the words. Confirm the words. Because the Lord will confirm the words of his messengers. So confirm the words with the Holy Spirit. Right? Remember, I'm leaving whosoever this belongs to. Do not go seeking divine answers using the devil's instrument. The Urim and Tumin were copied by the enemy in the Ouija board. But we're not going to be seeking out the devil's instrument for divine answers. The Holy Spirit will answer us in due time. Patiently wait. Do not give up. Strengthened 
your faith in the Lord. The Lord will give you the answers you seek. Right? Praise be to God. Let's pray. Most righteous and eternal Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Under the authority of the Holy Spirit. Father, we love you. We thank you. We give you thanks. We give you praise. We exalt your name. We honor you on high. We lift you up. Father, we are aware that except you guide us and lead us, we are all lost sheep. But Jesus, thank you for being our shepherd. You lead us and we follow you. You lead us and we honor you with our lives. Father, we are grateful to you. Thank you for sending us the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we are grateful. We are grateful. Holy Spirit, thank you for continuously and continually teaching us all things. Thank you also for continually and continuously comforting our souls. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for pouring out upon us your anointing so that when we go forth, we're anointed. Hallelujah. Father, we are grateful because you are sovereign. You are so exalted, most high. Who can be compared to you? We're grateful, we're grateful. Father, we your children come to you. We present ourselves. We confess our sins before you, Father. We repent of them. Father, we want nothing to do with these sins. They are filthy. They are not of you, and we want nothing to do with them. Father, we ask that you will strengthen our life in your word. Fill us up with your righteousness, Father. Fill us up with your peace. Fill us up with your joy. Father, preserve us in you. Because except you preserve us, we don't know how. Father... Holy Spirit, we need you. So, Father, we ask in the mighty name of Jesus that you will pour out your anointing on us through the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we need you. Pour out for us, Holy Spirit. Anoint us from the crown of our head to the sole of our feet. Not just outside, but inside us. So pour in us, blood of Jesus, sanctification and restoration. Holy Spirit, renew us through your almighty power. Renew us. Holy Spirit, consume everything not of God. Bash to pieces all the plans of the enemy, Holy Spirit. Dash every single demon hurling into the pit of hell from our life, from our, from our families. From our friends and our associates, cancel every single contract, association, link, marriage, covenant that you have not ordained, that you have not signed off on. Cancel them in the name of Jesus. It doesn't matter where they come from, even if they are with our enemies. Cancer them. Heavenly Father, through the mighty name of Jesus, release the armies to watch over our loved ones. Release the armies, Father, to do battle for us. Father, do not keep silent, Father. Not while the wicked is reigning, do not keep silent. Let them not have where to put their faces. Father, 
we we trust in you we believe in you we know you are powerful you are almighty and so we yield to you father let only your will for our lives be done father let the words of our mouths be seasoned with grace and be acceptable in your sight father let the meditation of our hearts be full of your thoughts and be centered around you and be influenced by the holy spirit holy spirit control our mind control our soul control our heart holy spirit lead us in the way that we should go and help us to grow holy spirit do a new thing in us today according to your good pleasure holy spirit we ask that you will blind the eyes of every single monitoring spirit. We ask that you will dumb them. We ask that you will confuse them and turn their knowledge foolish. We ask that you will turn them backward. Let them be so confused, let them lose their footing. And let them be led straight down into the pit for the day of judgment. Holy Spirit, cancel every single device that have been set up and for those who have fallen into them rescue them holy spirit help us to see and to know and how to discern evil we may not be able to see the evil spirit but help us to know to discern when the situation is evil help us to know to wait on you wait sometimes we don't have patience help us holy spirit give us patience help us to wait on the lord who will renew our heart and heal our mind and renew our strength Holy Spirit, we yield to you because we know you will help us. We are aware. Jesus, we thank you. Because all this is possible because of you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, according to your plans for us, which are good plans, and through your good gifts that you've rained down on us freely, Help us to bring honor and glory to your name. Father, in our going out, in our coming, and be with us always. Father, throughout the entire day and in the night season too. Help us to yield to you and to trust in you. Father, is there anything I have left out? You will fulfill according to your good pleasure. Father, the saints, let them always be before you. Father, the sinners, let them always be before you. Father, the wicked, let them always be before you. Give each of us opportunities to get to know you and give the sinners the ability to get to surrender, to join the family and give the wicked opportunities to turn around and to worship you. Father, we're grateful. We give you thanks. We pray for we pray for the people who blaspheme your name. We pray for the people who are busy practicing divination and don't even know it. We pray for the people who are busy seeking after their own selfish ambitions. We pray for the people who are down on the wrong road. We pray that you will help them, give them opportunities to turn around, to repent, to seek your face. Father, deliver us from evil. Father, 
preserve our lives. Father, put your words in our mouth. Father, put your hand on our lives. We need you, Father. And so, we trust everything that we did not mention in your hands. You know us well. Holy Spirit, pray on our behalf. We know that you will answer the request of our hearts, Father, because you said in your word you will answer us. And you will deliver us. We're grateful. And so, Father, we wrap our prayers in the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, our King. We anoint our prayers with the Holy Spirit's anointing. Thank you, Holy Spirit, our comforter. We send them up for you, Father, sweet Savior. May they be accepted in your sight, Father. We love you, Father. And we're praying in Jesus' name, the only name whereby we save. Praise Jesus. Praise King Jesus. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Let's go for it. Remember, with God, all things are possible through Jesus Christ. Peace be unto you as Jesus gives. So let's receive. All the best for today. Love you.